How do you approach essay, poetry, book clubs, and digital composition? If we reimagine our approach to these four areas, we can open the door to more engaged, connected, and challenging learning. I'm Brad from Heinemann, and that is the focus of authors Penny Kittle and Kelly Gallagher's newest book, Four Essential Studies, Beliefs, and Practices to Reclaim Student Agency. Penny and Kelly extend their work from 180 Days to Teachers in the Quest to Engage and Empower Adolescents by taking a deeper dive into these four essential studies, essay, poetry, book clubs, and digital composition. Their aim is to move beyond compliance and formula and to develop students' agency, independence, and decision-making skills. Penny and Kelly write that these four practices have the power to transform students' relationships with literacy and truly prepare them for the more demanding work of college. Hosting today's conversation with Penny and Kelly is their editor, Tom Newkirk. So I'd like to start, maybe Kelly, if you could start out with, um, this book is a a sequel to 180 Days, which is a, was a complex, important, incredibly valuable book. But why do you, why a sequel? What what do you need a sequel for? What does a sequel do? A sequel might be a little bit of a stretch, but it really kind of came out of the idea that when we finished 100, 180 Days, Penny and I sat down and we asked ourselves, okay, looking back at this book, this year that we spent together with our classes, Uh, sort of what did we get right and what did we get wrong? And one of the things that we felt we sort of missed the mark a little bit in 180 days is this idea of of a poetry unit. Uh, In that book, we use poetry quite a bit and our kids write alongside poems quite a bit. But when we finished the book and looked back, we thought, you know what? Poetry deserves its own standalone unit. And so this was sort of a follow-up, and that's kind of how the conversation began. And then I would say Penny, in seeing some of the students that she's seeing in her first year writing courses at Plymouth State University, started to kind of uh, come in with some other ideas that she was noticing kids missing. Yeah, in fact, I I can remember calling Kelly because we finished 180 Days in 2018. And I moved to Plymouth State that same year. And I remember calling him and saying, there are essential things these kids don't know that have to be taught before they come to college. And that's where the other three units came from. Essay, digital composition, which is something they're asked to do so much of. And then the ability to talk to each other about what they're reading. Well, that that leads to the question about college preparation, because you start out the book with the sense of some kids who think they're prepared for college, but they're not really prepared. And what does it mean to be prepared for college? And it's often thought that like a highly structured, formal approach to writing that focuses on literature is the primo preparation for college. And it seems to me that, you know, you're challenging that notion that a lot of kids have been sold a bill of goods that this isn't what really prepares you for college. I was wondering if you could talk about that. Well, I think um, one of the things we don't realize is out of the two sections of students I have right now, the 40 students, there's not a single one who's an English major. And so none of my students will be writing anything about books, analysis, like we teach in literature classes. And what they are asked to do are wide open questions where they have to do all of the thinking, all of the planning, and then all of the the work to make that piece of writing come to be. And what I noticed right away is that students had no confidence in figuring out the many things they're asked to figure out. And that I think we can build that confidence earlier by giving them more decision-making power in all of the writing that we do. What what do they have to figure out that they don't know how to figure out? Um, For example, the student that we start the book with is in a class that's a seminar course for freshmen at my university um, across the disciplines that's called tackling a wicked problem and she had chosen the section on climate change and she was asked to to review the the research on what is going to help us with climate change choose what she thought was the most important solution for us to get started on research that solution come up with a comprehensive piece of writing between three and four thousand words on the solution She's got to make all the decisions, what to research, what to prioritize, how to structure it and organize it. And there are no five paragraph essays that solve that problem. 
Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of this also, Penny and I have been thinking about this for a, a number of years now. I mean, we wrote a piece for educational leadership called The Curse of Helicopter Teaching. We know the research is very clear that helicopter parenting is not really good for kids. And that made us kind of wonder, you know, have we been guilty of helicopter teaching? You know, I work in a school district that's grades seven and 12. And so my concern there is before the kids get to Penny's college class, have they been given the opportunity to do the necessary wrestling with uh, reading and writing? Have they built those muscles? Uh, and I think sometimes teachers, in, in, a, in an attempt to be helpful to young writers, uh, do too much of the thinking for them. And then when they get to tackle a wicked problem, or as Penny and I were talking about earlier today, many, many universities have very wide open prompts. And when they get there, uh, these kids who got A's and B's in high school uh, almost feel like they're ambushed when they get to the university because they can't do it. It sometimes seems like part of what you're teaching them is how to do moves as opposed to structures. You know, Rather than having like, here's a formula, here's a form, here's some moves you make as a, as a thinker and as a writer. And these moves can go on forever and they can repeat themselves. Is that, does that make any sense? I, I agree completely. One of the words that you used with us, Tom, as our editor was options. And I think that's such an important word. Does a student have an array of options to choose from? Do they understand that there are lots of ways to begin a piece of writing, no matter what genre it is? And then do they know ways that authors have written those kinds of things so they can look at a text and say, oh, I see what this author's doing. They're introducing evidence here, they're adding an aside here, they're bringing us back to where they started at their closing. If they can name those things, they can use them across all different tasks. There's a lot of mentor text study in the book. You know, look at SAA, look at SAB, uh, and wh what's this writer doing? What's that writer doing? And, you know, uh, as Penny has done in her classroom, given stacks of essays for kids to look at, you have to be able to recognize the moves before you can implement the moves. Uh, yourself. And any essay that we bring out from the real world that, that we think is really a dynamic piece of writing does not look like what has become the high school essay or the junior high school essay uh, in, a, in a lot of places that we've, we, we have visited, right? So there's this chasm, there's this gap between what a school essay looks like and the kind of writing that we really treasure in the real world. It reminds me of a quote that one of my students, the person I interviewed um, a couple of years ago, this eighth grader said, it's like an essay strips imagination from kids that we, we don't, we're not really getting the essay right in schools. We're, we're teaching a form that's really not the essay. I couldn't agree more. I read books of essays. I told Kelly I'm reading Leslie Jameson right now, who wrote the empathy exams years ago and has now written... Um, make it scream, make it burn. It's just a series of essays. I, li I listen to them on Audible. I read them in the New York Times every day. And there's such a variety. I think you've said it before, Tom, right? That standardization creates standardized thinkers. We want kids to look at the possibilities uh, that are out there. But, you know, if I'm a teacher and I have determined what the exact structure of this essay is, I've already stripped you of a lot of the decision making that writers must make when they approach a piece of writing. And your creativity. And then add to that, Tom, I'm really struggling with this idea. Don't you think that if every kid in the class writes the same essay to the same prompt, that creates an inherent competition between kids? Like I know already Newkirk's going to write it better than I do, which is going to demotivate me. I think any time a teacher's got a stack of papers and the and the essays all feel the same, that that is a major red flag. That means to me that there's too much helicopter teaching going on, uh, and we have to explore ways to give kids uh, recognition of other options. We have to give them the space and time to wrestle with different approaches to writing. And I think too when we when we avoid and avoid and avoid reading what our students write because we know it's going to be tedious. That should be some kind of sign that we should change our game a little bit. And I think too that my students are in all different places. There's no room of writers that can all create 
a similar essay because they don't have the same skills. So when you are opening up your room to letting students make decisions, it really does reveal to you how much teaching they need. And it allows you to teach right at the point where they need your help. You know, when you sit down next to a kid, how can I help you? And they say, I have no idea how to put this together. You are allowed, you can personalize that instruction in a way that if they're all doing it the same, then like Kelly said, they don't have any decisions to make. And it's not just the same structure, it's the same pacing as well, right? One of the things we talk about in the book is that it's sort of old thinking, like Monday, everybody's pre-writing. Tuesday, everybody's beginning an initial draft. You know, Wednesday, you know, you can't contain every writer in the same pace because the creative process is very different for different kids. Now, one of the things I think sometimes when you use the word choice, and choice I think is a key, a key term in this book. Some people, when they hear choice, they think of like a little bit laissez-faire. Everything's open. I'm not going to structure anything for you. And so they, it's kind of like a divided line. It's either that or it's like highly structured. Now, you're, you're on neither one of those poles, I think. So what, what, does, what does choice mean for you? Well, uh, I think that answer differs uh, if you're talking about reading, if you're talking about writing. I would say on the reading side, one of the reasons we devoted a chapter to book clubs is what that we found in our own practices in high school that a book club experience where kids have at least partial choice of what they're going to read was the primary motivator for some of our most reluctant readers, those kids who are serial abandoners, and even those kids who like to read but have kind of fallen into that groove of fake reading. Uh, we have found that giving them choice and bringing in books that are more relevant to them uh, it was really, really a motivator to get kids back into a reading lane. Yeah, and right now my students are in um, lap two of narrative and lap one of research. And what that means is that they wrote a nonfiction personal essay, and now they're writing a researched fiction piece. And what they're doing is practicing those same skills they learned in narrative to develop scenes, to develop um, pivot points or transitions between them, to think about the momentum of your piece. And they're using that to tell a ghost story that lives somewhere in the world. And most of them are choosing New England. And they're retelling the ghost story, but weaving in research. So it's the first time I'm really having them take research and have it supplement some of their own thinking, but they're doing it in this realm of fiction. So if you think about that structure means that the kids are all researching ghost stories. So there are similarities. It's not like you remove all of the guardrails. I want them to learn how to weave in quotes. So I'm teaching that in my pieces of my mini lessons. But I also want to ignite their imaginations. One student's writing about um, a cathedral that's filled with a thousand skulls and it's in Portugal and it invites all of these voices of ghosts while another kid's writing about the ghost at the corner house inn just down from the university. I mean, I put limits around what they're creating um, in many cases, but a nonfiction personal essay could be about anything. But a nonfiction personal essay has a form that we teach. And I would say a lot of, a lot of kids come to me or came to me uh, with this idea that writing in an English class is really about answering questions. It's really about uh, extracting information to please the teacher. When you give choice, uh, I love what Penny just said about igniting their imagination, but you're also honoring you know, their voices and their experiences. For me, the most reluctant writers I have are writers who uh, feel like their voices have, were, were not listened to for many, many years. When you open up choice and student A is writing about uh, her mother being deported, and you sit next to that kid and you're conferring with that kid, there is something that happens between that, that teacher and that student that's not gonna happen with anybody else in the room, right? Because it's that kid's unique point of view. And I think when the kids are, are given the space to bring in that choice of what's meaningful to them, that that really is a, a motivator for them to, to write. And it seems that you also surround the, the, the students with options of how they might deal you know right on those topics so there's a richness of the, the community and richness of sense of options and choices and models and so it's not in this void 
Right. And so in one section of the book, we, we show uh, 10 different essays or nine different essays. You know, this one's a circular essay. It begins with an antidote. It does its thing. It comes back to an antidote. That's very different than a list essay, right? Uh, we look at different writers, even one writer who writes in different directions depending on audience and purpose. And so showing students what, what these essays look like and having them sort of examine them and, and crowd around them and, and make, you know, anchor charts of what they're noticing in, in, in the different structures. I mean, Penny, why don't you say a little bit about the, sort of that micro study versus big study? Right. So we talk about a, a, one of the first practices that's important is the drone view of an essay. How is it all put together? What are the parts? And having kids really just tease those out of a whole collection of essays, you know, a stack of three to five essays, and then look very closely at one paragraph and look at the moves that are made here. Look at this use of verbs. Look at the sentence structure variety. Um, look at the pivot point for the next paragraph. Those kinds of studies from whole text to small parts of a text help students rely on each other because they're doing these in small groups and we're wandering around listening to them is transferred to their writing groups where they're sharing their work with a handful of kids that they stay with the whole semester or the whole year. And they learn from these other students different ways to think about writing something. I would say in my own practice that that I was pretty good at like mentor texts, like small passage study. But the drone view, I think, in my own classroom uh, came in very late and was extraordinarily helpful for my students to see the building blocks of how different essays are put together. And I think that has relevance when our kids are trying to decide how to put their essays together, right? So you might have this story written, you know, um, in storyboard form, but should this part be first or maybe you should rearrange it and this part be second? I think kids start to think in that direction when they take uh, what Penny has referred to as the drone view. And it seems to me another resource that you they have is you modeling or trying out some of these things yourself. And I think for me, one of the most interesting features of, of the book was uh, when each of you are trying something new. And I think particularly, Kelly, when you tried on the multimodal composing, which is not something, you know, I mean, Penny's done a lot more of it than you have. And you said on the developmental scale, she's here and you're here. What was it like to to try that out? scary. Uh, and, uh, you know, in some of that digital composition work that I did initially uh, with my ninth graders and 12th graders, I had to seed my power in the room. I had to say, you know what, there are kids in this room who know how to do things better than me. So if you want to learn how to do X, you're over here in this group. And if you're over here, if you want to learn how to do Y, you're over there in that group. Uh, and then I would sit in in the groups and I would uh, try to learn you know, a, another move that I could make in iMovie or something like that. One place where it was really evident, you know, that I had to go outside of my comfort zone was when Penny said to me that, you know, if you teach poetry, it's like teaching an essay. If kids are going to write, you have to write. Uh, and so if we're going to teach poetry, we should look at the newly revised Bloom's Taxonomy, uh, which has put creation now at the top of the pyramid. Right. And so much like you wouldn't ask a kid to do writing without doing that writing yourself as a teacher, this applies to poetry as well. And so I, I think that's one of my favorite sections of the poetry study in the book is that I did a poem. But it's not it's not just, hey, look at Kelly. He wrote a poem. It's as a teacher. What did that process teach me about going into my own classroom and, and teaching kids, you know, inside of a poetry unit? And I, I wouldn't have done that had my co-author not pushed me. What did you learn by going through that process of writing, writing the poem, which is not something you do on a regular basis? Well, I think in the book, we, we list a number of things, but I would just say off the top of my head, like the first thing I learned was not to panic when something doesn't come to mind. We take the reader through, I, I don't know, Penny, it was like four or five false starts before I actually landed on a topic that I felt like, okay, and it's the journey to that, right? Penny often talks about writing and writing and writing to, towards a surprise. And so it, it took me, you know, three days of kind of wrestling with it before I even got to a topic that I felt comfortable. Oh, this is where I want to go. 
The other thing I would suggest is, as it's very common in when we have kids in writing groups, is when I had a draft and Penny gave me mid-process feedback or, or coaching suggestions on that poem, that immediately that poem moved to a much nicer, better place. And so that mid-process, not end process, but that mid-process peer response, not peer editing, but peer response was super valuable. I want to ask you a question about book clubs. One of the things that you did with your book clubs is to have students exchange perceptions across the country, if I have, if I have that right. So that, you, you know, you, you had kids in, uh, was it Plymouth or Conway talking to kids in, in, in New Hampshire, talking to kids in, uh, in California? Um, what was that like? I, I, I thought that was really powerful when I, when I saw the video of these, these exchanges. Could you, could you talk about that? I think that the, the first thing we noticed is that our students were really interested in what kids somewhere else thought, and they knew they'd never meet as much as we would love to have a little field trip. They were never going to meet these kids. My mind kept saying, I'll never go to California, but I'm really, really curious like about where they live, the posters on their walls, because we did it on Flipgrid. But as the book club progressed, their questions were deeper, their responses became just increasingly serious. What was that one kid's, um, this book was a godsend to me, one of Kelly's said, because I'm half Mexican, half white, a Mexican white boy by Matt De La Pena really said something to him. It was such a vulnerable moment and he posted it and then other kids could respond to that with their own understandings of the book. It was this wonderful way to bridge two cultures as well. You know, I have this rural New Hampshire setting Kelly's is a much more urban setting with a lot more diversity in his classes. And so my students were learning from kids their age in response to similar thinking about books. I think we, we learned this immediately when we started to work together for 180 days when my kids and Penny's ninth graders read Romeo and Juliet at the same time, that we just noticed the engagement level of our readers and writers was elevated by knowing somebody outside the room was going to hear what they had to say and respond to what they had to say. And so that idea that in a digital age, there's an opportunity to connect classroom A and classroom B was really rich. And I think we rode that into other book club experiences with 12th graders and other writing assignments uh, later in the year. It was very powerful, very powerful. My final question, Maybe start with you, Penny, on this one. What did each of you learn from the other, either in terms of writing or in terms of teaching? Well, it'd be impossible to answer with the time we have left all of the things that I have learned from Kelly. But in particular to writing, Kelly is um, a really good editor and he's very um, concise and direct about things that he's trying to accomplish in a passage or um, a section of the book. And I'm much more of a rambler. I like write all around the question. And I also write in my notebook. So Kelly at times had to get these awful screenshots of my notebook and weed through them. Um, so I'm sure it was much more torture for him. But I, what I found is that the two together is really powerful. I am much more willing to take a subject and expand and go and kind of wildly not connected directions, but Kelly will find a path through that and begin to put it into a cohesive place that then my own thinking makes better sense. For me, I would take the other side of that equation um, because our writing processes are, are so different. I've learned to appreciate that I know when Penny says, no, today I don't wanna write about A, I wanna write about B that she would not say that unless she's onto something and she's not, and she's onto something that's brilliant. I would also concur that there's just not enough time to talk about how Penny Kittle has uh, influenced my thinking and my teaching. Uh, and so in a way, our, our divergent approaches is, is, is hard, but it's also really, really rich. We're writing a chapter right now for a new book that's coming out, and we're just kind of starting to spit out words and and trying to mold them together. And I think it's the talk. Do you think this might go here? Do you think that might go there? To have a thinking partner when you're composing something 
is is beyond you know it's invaluable. I, I hope people hear that. Don't just think, well, these are two authors. What I'm suggesting is that wherever you are on your school site, if you have another teacher in which you can sit down or not at your school site, somewhere digitally, but if you have a thought partner, your practice is going to be better just by definition of having somebody else to bounce things off of. I can't tell you how many times I, I say to Kelly, okay, so this happened yesterday in class and and this is what I was thinking, but I was just wondering what you think about it. That's just invaluable in your own professional development and growth. Because Kelly will remind me of stuff that I've forgotten that I know. And sometimes he just echoes what I thought I wanted to do and it gives me confidence to stay that course. But I love like in the essay chapter, you know, there were times where Penny would show me a draft and she'd say, okay, as a teacher, what would you, this is a mid-process draft, as a teacher, what would you do with this kid tomorrow? And she had an idea in her head, but then I would go ahead and share what I think. And then we kind of kicked that around. It's just really, really rich. Well, it's been such a privilege to, to talk to you about this book. And I just want to convey my great admiration for what you've done and the fact you've you know, manage the time zones and manage to produce these two excellent books. And uh, it was never, never hard work on my my end of the of the deal. It was just always a, felt very, very honored to to be be a part of this. So thank you. Yeah, thank you, Tom, for for all your input in the book. And I I don't know. I, I think Penny feels the same way, and she can chime in here. But I want to just say, you know, this far down the road, I think every time I write a book and then last two with Penny is they get better, they get richer, they get deeper. I think this is uh, a really good book. Uh, And uh, it's because of the rich uh, partnership that I have with my buddy Penny. (laughs) I was going to just honor your work, Tom, because you have this wonderful way of getting to the heart of what we've just created and asking the question that we were either avoiding or skating over and you would direct us back to, but what about, which I just appreciated so much. You were a perfect editor um, for this book. And as always, I learn so much in conversation with Kelly. Our thanks to Tom Newkirk for hosting today's conversation. And thanks also to Penny and Kelly for their time. Their new book, Four Essential Studies, Beliefs, practices to reclaim student agency is available to pre-order now from Heinemann.com and then it will begin to ship from Heinemann on November 2nd. You can follow both authors on Twitter, visit blog.heinemann.com for links to them and for a transcript of today's episode. The Heinemann Podcast is a production of Heinemann Publishing. It is produced and edited by Steph George, sound mixing by Steph George. Our creative producer is Lauren Audette. And our executive producer is me, Brett Whitmarsh. To learn more about the Heinemann Podcast, visit blog.heinemann.com. Thanks for listening.